I've been so excited already tonight just to meet people from um, near and far, kind of here for the first time. And you are so, so welcome. I've uh, met people from as far away as Ireland and even further New Zealand. Um, anyone from further than New Zealand? I think you'd do well, like Australia or another planet or something like that. But wherever you're from, it is really good to, um, to have you here tonight. And um, We've, we've just for the last few weeks been in, in this series, part of the family, where we've been looking at what it means to be the people of God together, how the work of Jesus has made us family together. That affects the way that we um, relate to one another. Uh, we're not just all in the same room. We're not just a social gathering. We're not all just excited about Jesus. No, we're family together, the, the family of God. And so, um, and then we, we kind of tend to talk in terms of um, being part of Grace Church, kind of key things there, being, um, being in home group together and serving together and um, giving into life for the church. So we looked at those things. But tonight, we're just going to um, finish off, off this series by looking at what it means to welcome people into the family. So if you're here for the first time, it's, it's a, a super one for you just because our heart really is that as you come to Nottingham, if you've moved from elsewhere or just um, started uni here or a new job or whatever, that you know the welcome of God in your life and that that be kind of expressed through the community of his people. So after meeting tonight, we would love to get to know you and get to know your story and uh, maybe kind of um, help you get to know people in Nottingham as you, as you navigate your, um, your way around here. Um, in fact, we, we regularly get kind of new people joining Grace Church. And so uh, not just new students, but um, even over the summer, it's, it's been the kindness of God where we've um, had uh, several kind of middle-aged couples join the church. And I went for coffee uh, with one of them this week and just beautiful, godly people. And we, we thank God that, that he's kind of adding people to us um, because that, that's um, a work of his grace. And so the reason we're looking at some of these foundational topics tonight really is because how many of us know that the strength of our foundations determines the longevity of our work, right? You can't build something long-term if the foundations are rubbish. We got any engineers in the room? Yeah, John, you were saying you're an engineer. Anyone else? Yeah, you'll be able to give like proper kind of scientific basis to that. But my favorite story to illustrate this is that my wife's from, um, from Torquay in Devon. And um, there's a house there just on the, on the cliff edge um, where uh, some guy from London thought, oh, it'd be really nice to have a house by the sea. Uh, found this one. Didn't bother with a survey. You know, who needs to do that on a house? And then for the last few years, it's seen part of the cliff edge fall away. So the garden is completely completely gone. The house is about to go, and this guy's uh, looking um, a little bit silly. The strength of the foundations determines the longevity of the work. And when we talk about the welcome of God and welcoming people into our family here, I think we'd, we'd all agree that's a wonderful and, and a good thing. But if we want a sustainable and lasting culture of exhibiting the welcome of God amongst us to everyone, wherever they're from, what, whatever they're like, I'm sure we'd all agree that we have to look to God, the rock of ages, the one whose word is immovable, the immovable rock uh, um, uh, uh, who who's, has no beginning and no end to transcends time, rather than just saying, hey, let's talk about welcome, top three tips of welcome, and just like G us all up, um, because we're, we're limited, aren't we, in ourselves? Sometimes we have skewed priorities, or um, sometimes we find that quite difficult. We've got any introverts in the room? I'm an introvert. Yeah, you will hate me calling you out, won't you? Um, but um, I, I'm an introvert. That, that can be hard in kind of welcoming um, people in. So we're going to look tonight at the why and the how of welcome amongst the people of God, because the why affects to what extent we get involved personally. And actually, this isn't just due to do with Grace Church. Actually, this, this is to do with, with the people of God as a whole. And so for some of you who've just moved to uni, throughout the next few weeks, you'll be meeting all sorts of people. You probably have the same conversation with every single person you meet. You know, what's your name? Where are you from? What course you're doing? Did you do a gap year? Where are you living? What halls you're in? All of that. So you want to print it on a T-shirt and fast track that. But you've got a huge opportunity to exhibit something of the grace of God to everyone that you meet. And so looking at the why of welcoming people into the kingdom of God is, is, is really, really important. The how, I suppose, is just the practical barriers, isn't it? And I think actually scripture um, speaks to us about how to come overcome those as well. 
So to do that, we're going to go to, to the words. So this is the basis for everything that we do and teach and, and build church life on. What else could we build it on if it's not um, the word of God, our sure and steadfast foundation? And um, we're going to look at a story from uh, the book of Acts in chapter 18. And it involves these two figures called Aquila and Priscilla. And I wonder if you've ever uh, met a couple where you are sure of the name of one of them, but the other one, you have to work it out by default, you know, or a couple of friends or something. And I have this with Aquila and Priscilla all the time. Hang on, which one's the husband and which one's the wife again? Because Aquila sounds like that could be a man's name or a woman's name in our culture, doesn't it? I suppose Priscilla is is more commonly in the UK, at least, um, uh, a, a female name. So Priscilla is the wife. Aquila is the husband, and it's these guys I want you to look out for um, in this story, um, as well as Paul, who's one of the leaders in the early church, and a guy called Apollos, who's a kind of young, up-and-coming guy. And um, here's what is written. Here's what Luke writes in um, Acts chapter 18. So he says this. After this, Paul left Athens, it's obviously in Greece, and went to Corinth, which is also in Greece. And he found there a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, which is in Turkey, recently come from Italy. So we're stacking the countries up already. And he had come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Who's Claudius? Claudius was one of the Roman emperors. Uh, When Claudius came to power, they thought that he was going to be absolutely useless. By Roman standards, at least, he turned out to be quite a good emperor. He invaded Britain, in fact. That's how the Roman Empire came uh, to Britain. But one of the things, as we can see here, that he did at some point in his reign was he kicked all of the Jews out of Rome. So, And he, that's Paul, went to see them. and uh, That's Priscilla and Aquila. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers. And he, it's Paul, reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So Paul's met Priscilla and Aquila. But look what happens if you jump down to verse 18. They do a load of mission in Corinth. And then it says, after this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, which is way east. Well, I'll show you on a map in a moment. And with him... Priscilla and Aquila. They've only just met him. Already, they're happy to travel with him. At Sencrie, which is right next to Corinth. Why couldn't Luke have written Corinth? It's way easier to pronounce than Sencrie. Paul cut his hair because he was under a vow, and they came to Ephesus, which again is Turkey, and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reason with the Jews. So Aquila and Priscilla are in Ephesus in Turkey at the moment. And then look what happens in verse 24. A Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, that's in Egypt, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man and competent in the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but what happens when Priscilla, the wife, and Aquila, the husband, heard him? They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, this story is moving at 100 miles an hour, but what we've got going on here is what's known as Paul's second missionary journey. It's like a big trip he did to lots of places, telling people that Jesus Christ changes lives. And when we slow the story down, we see a whole lot more going on than just the speed at which you're tempted to read it on surface level. It's like the VAR equivalent, the snickometer, if you like. Slow it down and you see a whole load more. And what we see in the story is a couple that have experienced and been changed by the welcome of God. So we saw in verse 2 that they were in Rome, and then suddenly the emperor kicks all the Jewish people out of Rome. And so they toddle off to Corinth. So this isn't them being in Corinth. is isn't some like long planned trip. It's not sort of, we felt the call of God, and so we better go of it. No, they've been kicked out. They have nowhere to go. It's probably very sad circumstances, leaving behind friends and perhaps property and arriving in Corinth. They've only just got there. Maybe some of you identify with that tonight. I've only just arrived in Nottingham. And yet they're quick to receive Paul into their home and to build relationship with him. It says in in verse 3, he was of the same trade. He stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers together. 
You know, sometimes we can think in the welcome of God, oh, I'll do that once I'm a bit more sorted or available. You know, I'll have people round once, my, um, once I've set up my house, or I'll build friendships once this kind of busy season of life is over. But actually, it's in those inconvenient moments when the welcome of God is perhaps most effective, isn't it? Perhaps most authentic. I'm not all together. Actually, this is a bit of inconvenience, but I welcome you in because I love you. And in this step of faith then, what what happens uh, to Priscilla and and Aquila is that God does something in joining them, their hearts, with Paul, such that by verse 18, the middle passage that we read, they're happy to leap up sticks again from Corinth and travel over to Syria. In fact, let's just stick the map on the screen just so this doesn't sound like a load of places. So this just shows you what's going on. So the red arrows are Paul's big journey. But over on the west side, which is sort of modern day Greece, that place called Acacia there, that, that's, where, that's where everything began. That's where Corinth is. And they've traveled just east to Ephesus, where you can see under the big word Asia. Paul himself has gone on to Syria, which is, is that far away. But look how much travel is taking place even though they've only just arrived. God blesses them. He unites their heart to Paul, and he establishes trust quickly. And then they arrive in Ephesus, and what happens again? The same thing happens again. They've only just got there, and then this guy, Apollos, arrives on the scene, and what does it say? It says that, well, they heard him preaching in the synagogue. They could see some things needed to change in him, so they took him aside, and they explained to him the word of God more accurately. Why are they doing this? Why are they inconveniencing themselves? Why are they reaching out? Are they just good examples of welcome or hosting that most of us think, oh, wow, that's way beyond what I could do? They're doing it because the gospel of Jesus Christ compels our welcome. It compels our welcome. It's not about our gifting. It's not about our circumstances. It's about us having been changed by Jesus. And you know, when you read the Bible, you, you can read it with one, with one of two approaches. You can either say, you know, the Bible's got lots of like good life advice in. It's sort of how to live the Christian life. It's, it's sort of um, God telling us how to do the stuff. And so I'll, I'll, I'll read it and kind of learn how to live the Christian life, if you like. Or you can say the Bible is primarily about God showing us who he is. It's his story. It's not about what we need to do. It's about what he has done. It's about in the beginning creating a people and then telling them to fill the earth with other people who look like him. It's about humanity messing that up by turning away from God. And then a whole story of God ensuring that his people get to the places that they need to be, getting the covenants they need to be with him, get where he wants them, ultimately coming himself to make a way to join us to him such that by the end of the story, you see a people celebrating of every tribe, tongue, and nation because we've been joined to God forever, right? It's, it's, it's either of those approaches. The, the first one leads us to say, oh, the Bible's just about seeing the figures and trying to imitate them. Or it's about rules we're meant to live by or achievements that we're, we're, me, we're meant, to, um, meant to hit. The second one's about saying, no, this is about the beautiful gospel that has the finished work of Jesus. It's about saying that our identity is secure and set because as we were celebrating in our worship time, Jesus has reached down and he saved us and he's changed us and he's given us a new heart. The difficulty with thinking the first way is that you can't even always tell whether the actions of the people in it are meant to be good or bad. We're just after Vision Sunday next week, we're about to start a series looking at the life of Jacob. And sometimes he does things, you're like, I don't know if you're doing what you're meant to or not. That's just not the main point of the passage. The passages are all about God just bringing his purposes through because it's all about who he is. Or sometimes the figures in the scripture, they just seem to fail awfully, don't they? You've got David, like a man after God's own heart. And yet some of the things he did were horrific. Or even like when, when it's obvious, when people are doing good things, kind of honoring God in scripture. Do you know, sometimes in my own life, I struggle to even imitate those. I take Gideon, for example. I'm probably pretty good at doing the Lord, I'm useless bit. But actually, the kind of the, the sense in which I will, will trust God when he seems to be taking things away from me, well, that's just all that much harder to do, isn't it? 
You can read the Bible like that, but if you do it at the start, this just becomes examples and it means go away and do it. Or you can say, this is a story about who God is and about how the gospel changes lives. And you can say, that was a supernatural thing. So anything that flows from that is ensured and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So what's going on here? This is not just Priscilla and Aquila just being a good example to imitate. No, it's so much more than that. It's about the work of the gospel. That's the book of Acts, actually. The Acts of the Apostles, it gets called. It's about right at the start, Jesus being with his disciples and saying, look, just wait here because I'm going to empower you with the Holy Spirit who will live amongst the people of God in their hearts and cause you to witness to me all across the world, including your campuses, including your college rooms, including your, um, your offices, modern day readings, obviously, into um, ancient places. But then, and, and, and then what we see is the Holy Spirit falling on the people of God. And this is what Rosie was preaching on last week. And seeing the work of Jesus being testified to and seeing community being formed and seeing people welcomed into God's people. And then it continues to track um, key kind of players in the story. The apostles, they simply get called. So you get Paul, Acts chapter nine, meets Jesus. His life is totally changed and then he lives it out and it follows his journey. And what you see in the book of Acts in which this is based is that the message of Jesus changes people's lives. And then they live it out, including all the trials, all the persecution. But when something incredible has happened to you, you can't deny that you're different. And that's exactly what happened with Priscilla and Aquila here, doing all this stuff. One of the commentators, David Peterson, he, he said this, it seems probable that Aquila and Priscilla were already Christians when Paul met them and that they'd encountered the gospel in Rome, in Italy. The context suggests that Paul sought accommodation and work with fellow Jews and was blessed to meet a couple who were believers in Jesus. And so what you see here is you see Priscilla and Aquila taking all these steps and welcoming people in and getting to know people. You just see the life, the, the fruit of a life that's been changed by Jesus. You see a conviction that welcome and reaching out is not just about being nice, but is a gospel necessity. That, the, a, a knowledge that, um, that, that kind of suffering and trials that, that we experience and as such as they experience in being kicked out of Rome are best dealt with and processed along the path of mission. Not just static in the kind of, right, I need to be sorted for Jesus now to use me. No, 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 no. we're on a mission together. And there's all sorts of trials and challenges that we live with on that mission. But well, being part of the welcome of God on a mission to make Jesus famous is what we're about. It isn't just that they were good at it. No, no, no. They had given their lives to something or someone. And that had implications. And it made them new people. What they're doing is they're simply living out the welcome of God that they had received in the gospel. Think of it like this. If you're a Christian in the room, think of your own story of how you um, came to know Jesus. If church is a new thing for you and you're just asking questions of life and faith, it's really great to have you here. And um, maybe you could think of a Christian friend that you might know the story of. Um, but if you can't think of anyone, don't worry. I'm just going to explain what happens to a person when, when they become a Christian. And so there, there was a time for lots of us in the room who, who know Jesus. There was a time when we didn't know God, wasn't there? And whether that is um, how would you describe your current reality and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, or maybe you might be thinking back to when you were a child or, or something like before you'd put your trust in Jesus. And, and the Bible has quite a clear sort of analysis of, of, of that moment where um, it says that at that time we were separated from God, that there was a, a chasm between us, that we were outside of the community of his people. It says we were lost, blind, spiritually dead, as we referred to it in, in her prayer earlier. And then if you know Jesus, God did something in your life, didn't he? And he likely used people, you know, parents or friends or youth workers or whoever. He showed you salvation. He revealed to you the sickness of your sin and the medicine of the gospel. He called you to himself, gave you faith to believe, and you said yes. Now, just think, what happened in that moment? You were welcomed, weren't you? Welcomed into the kingdom of God. 
adopted into the family of God. Your sin was forgiven, your shame was taken away, and he gave you a new heart and a new identity. He put his spirit within you, and so on. You could go on talking, such as the glories and the beauties of what Jesus has done within us. But actually, three very practical things happened to you in that moment, didn't they? Firstly, you were placed into a church family that you could call home. And actually, if you're just moving to Nottingham and looking for for a church, that would just be such a key thing. Just get plugged in in a church family somewhere where you can be known and taught and serve and get involved. But then the second thing is that as he did that, he gave you people to live the Christian life with, didn't he? None of us are meant to do this by ourselves. People that you can disciple, people that you can be discipled by. Perhaps older figures to show you life experiences. And then the third thing was that he set you on a mission to see more lives changed by Jesus and make you more like him in the process. And all of that is simply just what had happened to Priscilla and Aquila, and they were just living it out. All of that is the why of welcome. The how is is simply living out who Jesus has made us to be now. It's not about striving. It's not about let's just get really good at something. It's about let's see Jesus and live out of who he is. Because it would be inconsistent on this great mission, wouldn't it? Not to allow others the welcome that we so desperately needed. We had a joy of um, Mary. Where's Mary? Over there. Mary staying with us just before we started the um, the One Thing um, years. And Mary's part of the One Thing team. Um, just for a week, a week or so once. And um, my daughter Lizzie was trying to um, delay her bedtime. She's six years old. And so she was having quite the chin wag with Mary. She's asking you lots of questions, wasn't she? And um, anyway, Lizzie managed to convince Mary, Mary's a very kind person, to allow Lizzie to have this little teddy bear um, just, just for um, one night. So Lizzie came out of Mary's room with a big, like, beaming grin on her face with this, with this teddy bear that she'd, um, she'd borrowed from Mary. She's really going to look after it. And, um, and then Zach, my, uh, my son, he's, he's four, he came up with these two animals that uh, him and Lizzie kind of share. They alternate uh, night by night. And Lizzie, with this big grin, was like, oh, it's my, it's my turn with those ones. And we, we had a little chat about it. And we said, hey, do you know, Jesus once told a story about someone who'd been given an incredible gift. Let's say he was given 500 pounds. Actually, in the story, it says he was forgiven a whole lot of debt, but we don't really do debt with a six-year-old. You know, we can wait till university for that. <laughs> He's given a whole lot of debt. He's given like 500 pounds. And then he saw a person that owed him 10 pounds, and he said to him, hey, you owe me 10 pounds. If you don't pay me back right away, I am never going to lend it to you again. Again, you have to sound like a kid because the story says it talks about like putting him and his wife in prison. That's a little bit much for a six year old. (laughs) And we talked about how kind of people look around and be like, he's just been given 500 pounds. Why is he denying person that 10 pounds there? And we talked about when something incredible has happened to you. You can't deny that you're changed. You can't deny that then you want to give. You can't deny that it's changed you. It's inconsistent on this great mission not to allow others the welcome that we so desperately needed when we have been forgiven of so much and been blessed with so much by being part of the people of God. It's the gospel that compels our welcome, but it's the gospel that teaches us how to welcome as well. Because when we read this story in Acts chapter 18, all all Priscilla and Aquila did was just live as the people that Jesus had made them to be. And I'm sure they they grew in their learning how to welcome and engage with people, but mainly because they grew in becoming like Jesus. Actually, the practicalities of welcome are much less of a barrier than we think if we get the why, the why we're doing this. They welcomed because they'd been welcomed in. They received Paul into their lives because they recognized that he was a brother from the worldwide family of God. Their home was open because they were obedient to what Jesus said in Mark 10, that there's no one who left family or homes who will not in the kingdom receive homes to be in and family to know. They weren't even intimidated by Apollos, even though he's really competent 
You know, have, a, have a look what it says in, in verse 24. Apollos, he was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures, and you need to disciple him. Wow, it's the worst, isn't it? It'd be easy to feel intimidated. But they weren't because they'd learned where identity was truly to be found in who they were in Jesus. And then just look how their actions then show the glories and the beauties of who Jesus is. You could, you could label of their actions words like self-denial, reaching out, trusting God, seeing things in others that needed to change in a godly way, acting humbly, gripped by the mission of God. They were living like the one who had saved them. And, and perhaps if it, if it helps you, maybe just think back to um, if this is an um, experience you can identify. When you first joined a church, again, if you're just looking in, um, it's really great to have you here. Uh, but just, just think about whether for you it's how you felt coming in here tonight or when you, when you first joined a church. I, for, for me, I, I look back to um, Grace Church used to meet at the Notts County Football Stadium. And um, so I remember going in there into, um, it was a room that I didn't know. It was people I hadn't built relationships um, with yet. Um, it was a service I didn't really understand all of. You know, we passionately believe in doing what the Bible says and using the gifts of the Spirit, and that was a new thing for me, and so I had to be kind of taught from Scripture where that comes from. And, but I look back to that time, and I, I was insecure. I needed shaping. I, I needed the welcome of God. And again, if you, if you see this just as it's all about us and what we're meant to do, it kind of becomes a, a rule book. And the trouble is that then our limits just cripple us. They count us out. And probably, our, we, probably we just end up judging people, don't we, on whether they, we think they deserve our welcome um, or, wh or whether kind of welcoming people serves our own purpose. You know, like, oh, I could imagine you being my best friend forever and so I'll invite you around for dinner, but otherwise it's not to my advantage, you know? But if to welcome is to worship, if this is us living out the gospel, if this is being true to the work that Jesus has done within us, then denying ourselves or taking some risks or just making this a non-negotiable, well, it's who we already are. It's what God is already doing amongst us, which means we don't have to strive. We don't have to stir it from within ourselves. We just look at him and he empowers us to do it. It's not something that we have to be good at by our own volition. And it also means that our limits and our preferences, they just aren't the final word, are they? The final word is who he is. And so it's cool that um, Hannah's testified to something, but I would have a very similar um, testimony as well of like being an introvert and welcoming people. I, I, I do really love people. Don't hear what I'm not saying. It's just that if, if I was to relax, I would do it in a room alone, <laughs> quiet, um, rather than you know, a big party of people or whatever. But I mean, very practically for me, just living out the gospel, like, all right, so I'll do it. But it just means perhaps when we have people for dinner, for instance, I'll often be the one to just go and start the dishwasher just because I need a bit of a break, right? like just in honesty. Or um, uh, if we've got eight people around our dinner table, that's eight cups of tea that I can make individually and take you to one by one. That buys me 10 minutes, you know? <laughs> it's just finding a way, isn't it? Because this is important, because it's a non-negotiable. I, I love what Hannah said about hosting with, um, with, with other people. We really do welcome in team. And I, I love that... Um, I could introduce people to people I know in the room who would be able to talk to them about anything or invite to socials or home groups or whatever it is. Like I, I've just found that going for coffee with people or introducing myself to people or having people around, it's just so much easier with other people. And so we, we, can, we can do it together. And so if you're not sure how to welcome people, you know, like when the, the service um, finishes at half eight or so, like, okay, so it then begins, what, hang on, what do I want to do? Just, just grab a friend. Or if you've never met someone before, if, if, if you've never met people here before, we would love to meet, just, just stick around. Someone will approach you. And we would love to, um, to get to know you. He does it because God gives us what we need because that's the gospel, isn't it? He gives us what we need to do the thing that we can't do. And he often does it through the church. And so I just think, in me, but I'm not the best conversationalist at all. I can do it, but I don't thrive in it. But sometimes then I just think, well, maybe it's just my role to create context for other people to talk sometimes. It creates that, that kind of space for welcome, for community. I, I, I find that if, if I just think about it in terms of what I do, rather than what we do, then I just get really wrong on it. 
and I just end up talking way too much or asking too many questions, and that gets weird and intense, and nobody wants that. But you know, I think the thing that's been really key for me is to see welcome not just as one particular thing, but as the people of God being a magnet by virtue of what Jesus is doing within us. Welcome is the chat on Sunday, but it's the text in the week to see how you're doing. Welcome is the offer of coffee or dinner pre or post church, but it's maybe just deciding to do some activities together with other people. We're going to the cinema. Well, why don't we just text some people, see if they want to come, come to? Or it's turning up to home group just to help it to be a great place. It's choosing to ask someone's name rather than ignoring them because you've forgotten their name. Or it's making a list on your phone to help you remember people. Because this is what we've received, isn't it? And this is what we're invited into. I just want to finish with this. In John chapter 6, there's this beautiful, well-known story about Jesus feeding the 5,000. That's a jolly ringtone. I need to find out where you got that from. Um, there's this great story about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And he, he says to his disciples, you go and feed the 5,000, just the men. So there was, there was way more people than, than that. You go and feed them. And all they can conjure up is five loaves and two fish from this kid's lunch. And there's this beautiful story about Jesus using what's there to build something beautiful and in so doing, demonstrating who he is. And you know, Priscilla and Aquila that we've looked at tonight and they're traveling around and welcoming people in, like, it's not because they, it, it, they're not any incredible because of their gifting. They're incredible because they have an incredible savior who just used what they had for his glory. And so perhaps a, a question just to leave you with tonight is, well, what, what do you have then? Maybe in this phase of your life, you have some time. Maybe you are a good conversationalist. Maybe you have a table that you eat around. Perhaps you have life skills or friendship groups that you can invite into or hobbies to share with people. Well, whatever it is, as we welcome people into our church family and as we go on mission and welcome people into the family of God, hey, let's, by living out the gospel, let's change this. Let's trust that he is the one who will take our little lunches and just allow him to feed a multitude and we'll see what, we do, what he does. Why don't we stand together?